Darwinism. Most people have a vague idea of what it means, others know the theory well, but how many know the mystical origins of the theory of evolution? Hi, I'm Alexandra, your friendly neighborhood paradigm challenger. In this video, we explore how the theory of evolution emerged from the ideas of occultists who are followers of mystery religions. This video presents a lesser known history often overlooked and specifically focuses on the connection, or the missing link if you will, between the inventors of the theory and their devout occult religious beliefs. Mysticism involves seeking spiritual enlightenment and liberation from the material world through esoteric knowledge. While the theory of evolution offers a naturalistic explanation for the Earth's biodiversity, suggesting that advantageous traits became more common in a population over time, leading to the emergence of a new species. Despite their apparent differences, these two seemingly separate ideas may have a lot more in common than initially meets the eye. So where did the theory of evolution originate? Let's find out. The philosophy of evolution begins with a decline of sun and moon worship amongst the masses, which boils down to the deification of nature. Nevertheless, the naturalist philosophy persisted underground. Under more favorable circumstances, it reappeared as a result of the preservation of secret societies. From these societies, their scientists were quick to step in and take up the waning sun and moon worship torch, and thus, the new religion of scientism was born. For the sake of this argument, this agenda-based form of scholarly imperialism is not to be confused with legitimate science. Modern science is fundamentally about the use of measurement. Anything that does not fit the narrow box of science is disregarded. As the old adage says, facts don't lie, interpretations of the facts do. Science is not always fact, just an interpretation of fact. That's why it's important to question and not blindly accept opinions masquerading as facts. The field of science has repeatedly excluded some data from its measurements and falsified other data in order to support its own agenda. Let's not forget the Piltdown Man, otherwise known as the greatest scientific fraud of the 20th century. It was a hoax of gargantuan proportions, and people truly believed this for nearly 100 years. An entire generation believed a lie to be reality. An unfortunate amount of modern science isn't about the science or the data at all but about whatever the scientist is paid to present or suppress. As a special thank you to my paid subscribers on Substack, I've included examples of scientific failures in my article titled The Science of Cherry Picking. I appreciate every subscriber and your support means more to me than you know. All right, let's get back to it. The British Royal Society, a Masonic institution paving the way for scientism. Over 400 years ago, scientism's dominance hinged on two conditions. One, a science specifically designed for their agendas, and two, an institution to accredit and disseminate it. The path to creating an institution specifically designed to provide credibility for specially designed science that's now considered one of the most prestigious scientific organizations in the world finds its origins around 1645 in an informal gathering of philosophers called the Invisible College, who devoted themselves to the cultivation of what they called the New Philosophy. The name Invisible College was coined by Robert Boyle, one of its prominent members, and came from an esoteric Rosicrucian term. The Rosicrucians were a secret mystical society that did not have a physical location or meeting place. Instead, they considered themselves an invisible college of mystics joined together not physically, but spiritually. The idea of the Invisible College symbolized the hidden inner mysteries of nature and the cosmos that the Rosicrucians believed they alone had access to. The Invisible College is central to the Rosicrucians' conception of themselves as an esoteric order possessing secret wisdom. The meetings of the Invisible College played a crucial role in laying the foundation for the scientific revolution of the 17th century, also called the Age of Enlightenment. The period in which materialists and evolutionist ideas gained widespread acceptance in European society and influenced it in distancing itself from religion is known as the Age of Enlightenment. Virtually all the Royal Society's founding members were Freemasons. One could reasonably argue that the Royal Society itself, at least in its inception, was a Masonic institution. Masonry can be described as an organization of traditions that traces its origins back thousands of years to ancient pagan societies. It unquestioningly adheres to the customs and practices of various historical groups, including ancient Egypt, the pharaohs and their magicians, materialist philosophers from ancient Greece, hermeticists, Kabbalists, Templars, Rosicrucians, and the Masons who came before them. 
Many members of the Invisible College went on to become influential figures in the scientific community and contributed significantly to the development of what we call modern science. The reason this is so important is because it was this college that produced many changemakers, the influencers of the day. This Masonic institution laid the foundation for the scientism of today, not simply in careful testing and experimentation, but with its roots in philosophy and mysticism. In 1660, the Invisible College sought formal recognition and obtained a royal charter from Charles II. This officially established it as the Royal Society of London for Improving Natural Knowledge. So the Royal Society emerged directly from the Invisible College in 1660, though it had existed previously for over 15 years without formal status. The Royal Charter granted in 1663 marked the official incorporation of the Royal Society with a set of statutes and rights as an institution recognized by the Crown. It was here that members such as Isaac Newton gave rise to modern physics, while the philosophy of John Locke, a Freemason, paved the way towards modern ideas of freedom of thought. That thought reign, however, only extended as far as the rope of mysticism allowed, so it was less freedom of thought and more so just ancient beliefs rebranded. The British East India Company brought the Hindu belief of reincarnation to England, where it was adopted by the British Royal Society. John Locke extensively studied reincarnation and used it as inspiration for his evolutionary ideas. He expanded on the Hindu concept of reincarnation and formulated his own theory of evolution within a metaphysical naturalism framework. Erasmus Darwin, Charles's grandfather, wrote a book called Zoonomia in 1794, presenting his theory of evolution, which discussed the inheritance of genetic characteristics. As a Freemason, he drew inspiration from the Masons' occult doctrine called Becoming. Thus, the religion of the occult is evolutionary in character. Darwinian evolution, which was promulgated vigorously by the early Masonic Royal Society, is but one more rebranding of the elite's doctrine of Becoming. In fact, Locke's theory of evolution gains support from male members of Darwin's family. 200 years later, this occult concept of becoming would be transmitted to Charles Darwin, which gave rise to his book on the origin of species. Why does this matter? Because whatever science the Royal Society invented would be approved or be a byproduct of Masonic doctrine or thought. In The Meaning of Masonry, W. L. Wilmhurst reveals the worldview underpinning the new Masonic science. This, the evolution of man into Superman, was always the purpose of the ancient mysteries, and the real purpose of modern masonry is not the social and charitable purposes to which so much attention is paid, but the expediting of the spiritual evolution of those who aspire to perfect their own nature and transform it into a more godlike quality. And this is a definite science, a royal art, which it is possible for each of us to put into practice whilst to join the craft for any other purpose than to study and pursue this science is to misunderstand its meaning. Later in the book, Wilmhurst reiterates this theme. Man, who has sprung from Earth and developed through the lower kingdoms of nature to his present rational state, has yet to complete his evolution by becoming a godlike being and unifying his consciousness with the omniscient to promote which is and always has been the sole aim and purpose of all initiation. He means Masonic initiation. What he's saying is that Freemasonry pursues the esoteric ideal of the transformation of man into a god. This is the Freemasonic doctrine called becoming. The striving of man to become like a god where knowledge is the savior, like Gnosticism. Evolution means something completely different to the mystical, elite organizations than it does to the common man, who has been kept in the dark, more or less, about the origins. For example, the language of symbolism is powerful to those who were initiated into it. The five-pointed star is the Masonic symbol of becoming, or working towards Gnosis. And the six-pointed star is the symbol of completion, or attaining godhood. Freemasonry is based heavily on alchemy and the Kabbalistic philosophy. For example, in alchemy, the ultimate quest is the Philosopher's Stone, or to transform lead into gold, or to go from ignorance, like the common man, to enlightenment, or gnosis, or from a mere mortal to a god. Both the Kabbalistic philosophy and the Masonic philosophy share a common goal of attaining enlightenment, with the Kabbalah emphasizing the journey through 32 internal paths on the Tree of Life, and the external 33rd path leading to En Sof, while in Freemasonry, 
The 33rd degree represents the highest achievement and symbolizes reaching enlightenment through a progression of 32 internal degrees. Freemasonry incorporates alchemical and Kabbalistic principles, with the 33rd degree representing the pinnacle of achievement and enlightenment within the Masonic tradition. Interestingly, the Kabbalah calls their pathworking the Tree of Life, when it really represents something closer to the Tree of Knowledge of Good and Evil. However, it does not represent the trees of the Garden of Eden at all. It's actually its own dualistic system. It's called the Tree of Life because its polar opposite is called the Klepoth, or the Tree of Death. The mysteries operate off of mirrored imagery and dualism. The fall and the quest for enlightenment, tracing the roots of mankind's aspiration to become gods. Gnosticism emerged from a combination of diverse beliefs and philosophies, including polytheism, pantheism, the philosophical systems of Plato, Pythagoras, and Heraclitus. Additionally, the mystical and demonological aspects that developed after the Jewish captivity in Babylon created the Kabbalah and played a role in shaping Gnosticism. Some arguments actually state that Kabbalah originated from ancient Persian mythology, as the Jews were exposed to it during the Babylonian exile. Gnosticism, or mystery teachings, referred to a diverse set of religious and philosophical beliefs that emerged in the ancient world, emphasizing the acquisition of secret spiritual knowledge, or gnosis, as the path to salvation and enlightenment. It encompasses various ideas about the nature of existence and the human condition, often incorporating elements from different religious traditions. In Gnosticism, truth is subjective. The only unifying truth of Gnosticism is that enlightenment is the goal, or salvation. We can't have a discussion of mankind seeking to attain godhood without referencing its origin, the fall, in Genesis 3. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. The mysteries promote the idea that Lucifer liberated man from God by giving them hidden knowledge so they themselves could be as gods. Helena Blavatsky was the co-founder of the Mystic Theosophical Society and published Isis Unveiled, a book outlining her occult worldview that espoused the esoteric doctrines of Hermeticism and Neoplatonism. She described Theosophy as the synthesis of science, religion, and philosophy, proclaiming that it was reviving ancient wisdom. So you see, this is not quite science as you think you know it. Instead, it's just incorporating an ancient religion. What is that ancient wisdom she speaks of? According to her book, The Secret Doctrine, Volume 2, in this case it is but natural, even from the dead letter standpoint, to view Satan, the serpent of Genesis, as the real creator and benefactor, the father of spiritual mankind. For it is he who was the harbinger of light, bright, radiant Lucifer, who opened the eyes of the automaton, created by Jehovah, as alleged, and he who was the first to whisper, in the day ye eat thereof, ye shall be as Elohim, as gods, knowing good and evil, can only be regarded in the light of a savior. The automaton she mentioned is called a golem. The theme of lifeless matter spontaneously generating life goes back to antiquity. It derives from an occult concept presented in the Jewish or mystic Kabbalah where the golem, a lump of clay resembling an incomplete or shapeless form, is brought to life by magic. It's a humanoid made by man from clay and water with incantations and spells. So in essence, Blavatsky believes that Lucifer's enlightenment was the incantation and spell that brought the lifeless lump of clay that God created to life. Her ancient wisdom claims that Lucifer represents life thought, progress, civilization, liberty, and independence. Lucifer is the Logos, the serpent, the savior. This is the origin story of all mystics' doctrines, including that of the Rosicrucians, the Freemasons, along with countless other occultist societies that went on to shape science as we know it today. Now, whether you believe this or not, they certainly did. According to Harry Collins and Trevor Pinch, science is a golem. And according to the movie Frankenweenie, Science is not good or bad, Victor, but it can be used both ways. That is why you must always be careful. In the Bible, the tree of knowledge of good and evil is presented as a unique tree within the garden that God specifically instructs Adam and Eve not to eat from. 
By crossing that boundary and partaking of the fruit from this tree, Adam and Eve gained knowledge of good and evil, leading to their realization of their own nakedness, resulting in their subsequent expulsion from Eden based on their actions, which they knew were wrong. The tree's significance lies in the moral implications associated with them, knowing what was right to do and not doing it. They had access to God and could have asked him anything directly, but they didn't. In the same way, these mystery religions are just anti-Christianity. They still venerate a character within the Bible and just choose to call him the savior instead of God. He's still a creation, but somehow he became the creator. The mysteries embrace the oldest tale in the book, the fall of man to a lowered state of consciousness and the attempt to attain godhood. The basic story of evolution, then, is conscious beings slowly rising from a lower state to that of desirable adaptation, progress, and ultimately, perfection. A belief the men who invented this theory borrowed from mystic philosophies. The two go hand in hand. One is presented exoterically, the theory of evolution for the masses, while the other is esoteric, mysticism for the occult, elite, and secret societies, the ones who disseminate the information to the masses. With God being separated from the now accepted science, it allowed Freemasonry to introduce the occult doctrine of becoming, the belief in man's gradual evolution towards apotheosis, the highest point in the development of something. The mystery schools strive to attain godhood through works and esoteric study in order to gain enlightenment. Perfection, illuminism, godhood, gnosis, enlightenment, these terms are all interchangeable. Notice how repentance, dying to yourself in your old ways, and being raised again to live for Jesus are nowhere to be found in any of these beliefs. But it goes even deeper. The world is far more connected than it appears at face value. The beliefs in Jewish philosophy like the Zohar or Kabbalah mirror those found in Buddhism, Hinduism, Jainism, and many other religions. Theosophy encompasses all of these. The term theosophy comes from the original Greek term theosophia, meaning divine wisdom or wisdom of the gods. Theosophy blends Hinduism and Buddhism with Jewish mysticism. Gandhi met Helena Blavatsky, who co-founded the Theosophical Society in 1875, in London, and later said that it was her book, The Key to Theosophy, which helped him to realize the greatness of his own Hindu religion, and which saved him from being converted by the Christian missionaries in India. He wrote that theosophy is Hinduism at its best, on the other hand, the Zen Buddhist scholar D.T. Suzuki described the teachings of Levatsky as the real Mahayana Buddhism. As you should be able to gather by now, all mystery religions have the belief of self-deification at their core. Humanism believes that no deity will save us, we must save ourselves. These systems vary only in degree, but they are on the same axis of egotheism. Theosophist Helena Rorich wrote, Man is a god in the making. There are many shared elements between mystic philosophies and orders. Fundamentally, they acknowledge the presence of the God described in the Bible who brought about the creation of the universe. However, they choose to reject this God and instead regard Lucifer as the savior and the object of worship. This perspective manifests in various ways, primarily in the reverence for the creation rather than the creator. As Lucifer is also a created being, Lucifer means different things to different groups, but is generally seen as a force which bears light. The name itself is not a proper name, it is a title, coming from the Latin words lux, meaning light, and ferre, to carry. Gnostics believe that they are Lucifers, or ones who bear the light, the light of Lucifer's enlightenment. The Origin of the Origin of Species Evolution at its core is the development of a religious philosophy rather than empirical science. The first group to promote the theory of evolution in modern Europe was the Mystic Order of the Rosicrucians, a Masonic order that is basically a meeting point between the Templars and the Masons, and their members were seen as holding secret knowledge. Their purpose was to promulgate Eastern mysticism and philosophies that they claim they received from Atlantis. In other words, their ancient wisdom. But the most important legacy of this order is what's called naturalist philosophy of which the idea of evolution is a part. The most important characteristic of the Rosicrucians was the fact that they believed that every stage of development was a stage in the process of evolution. For this reason, they placed naturalism at the basis of their philosophies and became known as naturalists. This had nothing to do with atheism, so they were very religious, but the deity they worship is knowledge, or Sophia. 
Naturalism is the belief that nature self-organizes without a creator. Ancient secret societies, particularly those influenced by Pythagoras and Plato, employed a specific process for admitting members. Prospective initiates were attracted through mystical teachings, followed by a purging of what they called superficial religious notions and doctrines. Subsequently, they were introduced to philosophical and symbolic practices. Once an initiate successfully completed their apprenticeship, they underwent training in Neoplatonic concepts and gained access to the studies of chemistry, astrology, and numerology, which explores the meaning behind numbers. Sacred geometry is at the core of most mystic orders. They believe nature itself is the god. While the belief of naturalism was held by the Rosicrucians, it wasn't them who popularized the theory. According to Mackey's Encyclopedia of Freemasonry, that honor fell to Erasmus Darwin, 33rd degree Freemason and grandfather of Charles Darwin. He was the first person to promote the concept of evolution as we know it today. Even though Lord Mabato might object to that, more on him later. In 1784, Erasmus founded a society to manage the dissemination of his ideas, known as the Philosophical Society. He also helped form the Lunar Society, a special group of, quote, learned men who met together and discussed different ideas on full moons. Some men in the group included Dr. William Small, who taught Thomas Jefferson at William and Mary College, and Benjamin Franklin, who visited the Lunar Society and developed a lifelong friendship with Darwin. Interestingly enough, in an article by Lord Richie Calder, Lunar Society members were assigned the very esoteric title of Merchants of Light. That description of Merchants of Light was precisely the same description used for the utopian society presented in Sir Francis Bacon's fictional novel, New Atlantis, which was originally called The Land of the Rosicrucians. That light is central to the mystery traditions and represents the light of enlightenment. The light they seek is the light these merchants sell, the light of enlightenment, or gnosis. Perhaps it's the same as the light the Statue of Liberty is bearing. It was created by Freemasons Frederick Bartoli, the sculptor, and Edward Laboulaye, the creator and inventor, who proposed the idea of a giant statue, Libertas, replicating a deity venerated by Freemasons and mystics worldwide. Interestingly, the Statue of Liberty, who happens to be located in the Big Apple, is a depiction of the Colossus of Rhodes, a gigantic statue built to honor the ancient Greek god of the sun, Helios. Sun worship harkens back to the most ancient form of light worship amongst pagan nations. Often called Masonry's great philosopher, Manly P. Hong in his work The Secret Teaching of All Ages said, This gigantic gilded figure, with its crown of solar rays and its upraised torch, signified occultly the glorious sun man of the mysteries, the universal savior. The character that embodies this sun man and universal savior is Mithra, who was called a god of light and truth in the ancient Persian religion. Mithra, also called Apollo, was often associated with the sun, and his worship spread throughout the Roman Empire. A shrine to the god Mithra is on display at Yale University. He was also synonymous with Sol Invictus, the unconquered sun. The religion called Mithraism originated in the Middle East. Mithra was a Roman god of war and took his stories from the Greek Orion and is the equivalent to Nimrod. Zodiac signs were important to the Mithraic religion, and the main religion of the Persians was Zoroastrianism. Though it faded into obscurity, its principle of dualism lived on in Gnosticism and the mystery religions of the Roman Empire and beyond. I want to bring your attention to Mithra's interesting little hat. That's called a Phrygian cap. The Phrygian people lived in a region of Anatolia, modern-day Turkey, and were associated with the legend of King Midas. You know, the one who turned everything to gold. The Phrygian cap, however, is also known as the Liberty Cap, which became a symbol of freedom and independence. This hat of liberty made its way all throughout history. This is the story we're told by the imperial historian Suetonius, who notes that upon the death of the Emperor Nero in June of 68 CE, such was the public rejoicing that the people put on liberty caps and ran about all over the city. Crowds could rejoice in their freedom from an oppressive emperor by donning the red freedman's cap. Later, it would become the bonnet phrygian or bonnet rouge when it came into vogue in 1789 and 1790 as a symbol of liberty during the French Revolution. Red hats have historically been a political symbol of freedom and are symbolic to ancient mystic cults. 
Mithras cult was popular among soldiers and merchants, and it continued to be practiced even after the Roman Empire converted to Christianity, as most of the pagan rituals were simply incorporated into the Catholic Church structure. So has sun and moon worship really declined, or has it just transformed? The last known Mithric temple was closed in the 5th century AD. But Mithra's influence can still be seen in some modern religions and philosophies, such as Freemasonry. To paraphrase writer Ursus Major, Freemasonry is a continuation of Mithraism. So the decline of sun worship wasn't a decline at all. It was a metamorphosis. Back to the Statue of Liberty. According to the Scottish Rite Northern Masonic Jurisdiction, what they failed to teach in school, however, is the Statue of Liberty's Masonic origins and ties to Freemasonry. In fact, the Colossus in New York's harbor was conceived, financed, built, and installed by Freemasons. The structural framework was provided by fellow Freemason and French civil engineer Gustave Eiffel, who would later become famous for designing the Eiffel Tower. The Masonic origins of the Statue of Liberty are no secret. The cornerstone plaque features the square and compass. Did you know the statue's official title is Liberty Enlightening the World? It seems like the Statue of Liberty itself was a merchant of light. The light of evolution liberated mankind from viewing themselves as being created in the image of God. New names for old beliefs. According to the Masonic Scottish Rite of Boston, Erasmus's memory lives on with his grandson Charles carrying on his theory of evolution. So his torch was taken up by Charles who continued bearing the light to his fellow men. Prior to Darwin, James Burnett, also known as Lord Mombado, a high court judge, Freemason, an anthropologist from Edinburgh claims that a beautiful woman appeared to him in a fever and spoke to him in French about a philosophy that merged together the ideas of Aristotle, Newton, and what Darwin put forth as evolution. In the preface of Burnett's book, Ancient Metaphysics, he shows us the roots of his evolutionary thinking are found in Aristotle, Plato, Pythagoras, Egyptian, and Babylonian religion. Here is a quick overview of the history of evolution. The origins of the theory of evolution came from the Hindu Brahmins. Pantheistic evolution was passed down by Pythagoras to the Greeks. Thales and his Ionic school branched out from pantheistic evolution to naturalistic evolution. Plato and Aristotle's evolution ideas were dispersed through the Alexandrian school in Egypt. The ideas were followed through into the Middle Ages, the Renaissance, and into Freemasonry where they were preserved. Freemasonry and the Enlightenment had a rebirth of the philosophy. Lord Mabado and Erasmus Darwin carried the philosophy forward, and then Charles Darwin further developed the idea. Now, let's look at the men who continued to popularize the theory after Darwin. Francis Galton, Charles Darwin's cousin, was the founder of the eugenics movement. He believed human evolution could be achieved through science and population control. He put forth the idea that the governing classes of England should consciously guide the development of the human genetic heritage. Galton was one of the early promoters of Masonry's alchemical agenda. In Memories of My Life, Galton wrote, The publication in 1859 of The Origin of Species by Charles Darwin made a marked epoch in my own mental development as it did in that of human thought generally. Its effect was to demolish a multitude of dogmatic barriers by a single stroke and to arouse a spirit of rebellion against all ancient authorities whose positive and unauthenticated statements were contradicted by modern science. Galton would reintroduce the concept of alchemy under the guise of eugenics, a term derived from Greek for well-born. The basic ideas of eugenics were outlined in Galton's Hereditary Genius, a racist piece of writing advocating a system of selective breeding for the purpose of providing more suitable races or strains of blood a better chance of prevailing over the less suitable. In Galton's perspective, it was advocated that society ought to be organized based on eugenic principles. The envisioned structure of such a society would involve a hierarchical system where individual social standing would be determined by their genetic heritage. Leonard Darwin, son of Charles, was vice president of both the 1912 and 1921 International Eugenics Congresses. The first of these two meetings was the outgrowth of a 1911 gathering of the International Society for Racial Hygiene. Thomas Henry Huxley, was known for being Darwin's official spokesperson, who was a member of the Masonic Lodge and Alfred Milner's Round Table Group. Huxley was a British biologist and anthropologist who was best known for his role in promoting Charles Darwin's theory of evolution. 
He was known as Darwin's Bulldog for his vigorous defense of the theory against its challengers. Huxley's contributions to the promotion of Darwinism were not limited to his public activities. He also played a role in the professionalization of science in Britain. He helped to found the Royal Anthropological Institute and the British Association for the Advancement of Science, and he served as president of both organizations. The red tape began to reign in the true spirit of science and replace it with the dogmatic ideology of those who owned these institutes. He also helped to establish the scientific journal Nature. Huxley's work was essential to the acceptance of Darwinism as a scientific theory. Huxley had two grandsons, Aldous and Gillian. Aldous Huxley, author of books such as Brave New World, with quotes attributed to him such as, The victim of mind manipulation does not know that he is a victim. To him, the walls of his prison are invisible, and he believes himself to be free. And the propagandist's purpose is to make one set of people forget that certain other sets of people are human. His brother Gillian served as the first director general of UNESCO. He was described in Adrian Desmond's biography as someone whose work amounted to philosophical clashes between disabling fits. Gillian Huxley was a blue-blooded English biologist and prominent advocate for evolution. He contributed to the popularization of the theory through his writings and public lectures. He also endorsed the strategy of world population control. Huxley packaged his eugenic views as humanism. The Pelican edition of his essays, from the period between 1959 and 1962, were published as Essays of a Humanist. In Huxley's 1957 book titled New Bottles for New Wine, we are already justified in the conviction that human life as we know it in history is a wretched makeshift rooted in ignorance and that it could be transcended by a state of existence based on the illumination of knowledge and comprehension. Just as our modern control of physical nature based on science transcends the tentative fumblings of our ancestors that were rooted in superstition and professional secrecy, the human species can, if it wishes, transcend itself not just sporadically, an individual here in one way, an individual there in another way, but in its entirety as humanity. We need a name for this new belief. Perhaps transhumanism will serve. Man remaining man, but transcending himself by realizing new possibilities of and for his human nature. Once again, his belief is that the ignorance of humanity can be transcended with the help of the illumination of knowledge and comprehension. Gnosticism. Did you know that Huxley is described as the father of transhumanism? He popularized the concept, but he may have borrowed the term from his close friend, Jesuit Catholic humanist Pierre Teilhard de Chardin. Huxley held that it was now possible for social institutions to supplant human evolution in refining and improving the human species. Although Huxley was principally concerned with advancing the human condition through social and cultural change, the general notion of humanity transcending itself came to be adopted by the emerging transhumanist movement. The definition of transhumanism, according to Britannica.com, is transhumanism, a philosophical and scientific movement that advocates the use of current and emerging technologies such as genetic engineering, cryonics, artificial intelligence, and nanotechnology to augment human capabilities and improve the human condition. Transhumanists envision a future in which the responsible application of such technologies enables humans to slow, reverse, or eliminate the aging process, to achieve corresponding increases in human lifespan, and to enhance human cognitive and sensory capabilities. The movement proposes that humans with augmented capabilities will evolve into an enhanced species that transcends humanity, the post-human. In other words, the quest to obtain pseudo-immortality even though they see themselves as cosmic accidents. Ernst Haeckel, a zoologist, played a crucial role in establishing Charles Darwin's theory of evolution as a widely accepted worldview in Germany. He wrote a book called Dia Weltersel, The Riddle of the Universe, in 1892, which explored monism as a bridge between religion and science. This publication gained significant popularity and became a bestseller in 1900. It also served as a catalyst for the formation of the Initial Monist Society in 1903, which eventually grew into the Monist League. What is monism? It is the belief that all things in existence are part of the same unified oneness. Monists call this unified oneness different names like the universe, the source, nature, or many other terms other than God. Amongst his views, Haeckel believed that races were separate species and that Caucasians were the highest among these. According to him, the lower races, or primitives, were subject to annihilation. As a result, monism appears to have implications for moral and ethical considerations by promoting certain notions of superiority. 
the scientific journal titled Science published an article on September 5th of 1997 looking at the once highly thought of embryonic drawings of Haeckel as follows. It, Haeckel's drawings, looks like it's turning out to be one of the most famous fakes in biology. The theory of evolution implies millions and millions of years are necessary to perform species transformation, but Ernst Haeckel never explains the initial force behind this, or the series of events necessary for beings to evolve step by step. Haeckel has never been able to answer these questions except to claim spontaneous generation, which is as big of a miracle as God creating the universe. In other words, he simply had faith. The evolutionists' efforts throughout the 20th century to explain the origin of life ended in failure. The geochemist Jeffrey Bada from the San Diego Scripps Institute accepts this fact in an article published in Earth Magazine in 1998. Today, as we leave the 20th century, we still face the biggest unsolved problem that we had when we entered the 20th century. How did life originate on Earth? A living cell cannot be created by combining organic chemicals, even in the most well-developed laboratories of the world today. August Weissmann was a German biologist and eugenicist who promoted the idea that personhood is not holistic, as had been viewed prior to the invention of this modern evolutionary take. He started viewing a person as a mere mechanism to either be efficient or useless in the quest for racial purity. By solidifying this doctrine of supremacy within academic institutions, the concept of racial hierarchy gained a sense of scientific legitimacy. This mindset played a part in the ruling elite's endeavors to establish a scientific dictatorship in Western societies. Humanism and Masonry, unmasking the pursuit of a secular world order. The opposition to belief in tradition utilized natural science as a weapon, presenting newly discovered natural laws as ammunition in the fight for exchanging God for the deification of man. However, these new laws were not laws at all, but philosophical ideas originating in the mystery traditions. The bourgeoisie, seeking to challenge Christian dogma, eagerly embraced Darwinism, which suggested that humans, excluding themselves, evolved from lower animals. This theory undermined the foundations of Christian beliefs. Consequently, scientific discussions surrounding Darwinism took on the characteristics of a social and class struggle. Although Anton Panikowicz attributes the force behind the spread of Darwinism and the organized fight against religion to the elite, a closer examination reveals that a specific organization within the elite Freemasonry employed Darwinism in their battle against not just the sweeping generalization of religion, but against the idea of an intelligent design. According to J.D. Buck in his book Mystic Masonry, it is far more important that men should strive to become Christ's than that they should believe that Jesus was Christ. Humanity in toto, then, is the only personal God, and Christos is the realization or perfection of this divine persona in individual conscious experience. When this perfection is realized, the state is called Christos, with the Greeks, and Buddha, with the Hindus. This is part of a New Age belief called Christ Consciousness, which I discuss in my other videos. In The Lost Keys of Freemasonry, Manly P. Hall explains that this Masonic humanist doctrine goes back to ancient Egypt. Man is a god in the making, and as in the mystic myths of Egypt, on the potter's wheel he is being molded. When his light shines out to lift and preserve all things, he receives the triple crown of godhood and joins the throng of master masons who, in their robe of blue and gold, are seeking to dispel the darkness of night with the triple light of the Masonic Lodge. Today, humanism has become another name for atheism. According to the Humanist Manifesto 1's first point, humanists regard the universe as self-existing and not created. This takes the idea of atheism one step further and posits that there is no god other than humans. Humanism entered Europe from the doctrine of the Kabbalah. With the spread of the Templar tradition through Europe, the Kabbalah began to attract a number of philosophers. So, in the 15th century, a current of humanism began that left an indelible mark on the European world of ideas. During the early Renaissance in Italy, humanist associations emerged seeking to challenge the established order operated in secrecy, and were characterized by their opposition to the traditional interpretation of the Bible. They developed their own interpretation of the Bible, drawing from occultist elements from North Africa, particularly Egypt, as well as the classical Jewish Kabbalah. Italian humanists developed their own system of Kabbalah, where they reconstructed the concept of gnosis and transferred it to a thoroughly concrete plane. 
the special gnosis they sought was a secret knowledge of how to master the blind forces of nature for a socio-political purpose. This idea is even reflected in the gardens of Italian nobility. The Medici, the ruling dynasty of Florence, used gardens to demonstrate their own power and magnificence. According to Helena Attlee, during the first half of the 16th century, magnificence came to be perceived as a princely virtue, and all over the Italian peninsula, architects, sculptures, painters, poets, historians, and humanist scholars were commissioned to concoct a magnificent image for their powerful patrons. Mastery of nature showed one's power as a god amongst men. Initiates of the early humanist associations were devotees of what they called the Great Force, the Great Architect of the Universe a term still used by Masons today. According to Masonry's beliefs, it is not God, but naturalist and humanist concepts such as nature, evolution, and humanity that are regarded as divine. Upon a cursory examination of Masonic literature, it becomes apparent that this organization is essentially a manifestation of organized humanism. Additionally, it is evident that the organization's objective is to establish a worldwide secular order rooted in humanist principles. These concepts originated among the humanists of 14th century Europe, and contemporary Masons continue to advocate for and uphold them. Humanism, starting with organized Kabbalist humanists in the 14th and 15th centuries, has distanced itself from the Creator and elevates mankind as the highest form of being in the universe. It essentially amounts to the worship of humanity itself. This belief persists even in modern Masonry and can be seen throughout ancient and modern sciences. The bloody French Revolution of 1789 was a result of this philosophy. The revolution was fueled by Masons, who championed slogans promoting moral ideas like liberty, equality, and fraternity. However, the revolution resulted in tens of thousands of innocent individuals being sent to the guillotine, a contraption proposed by Freemason Joseph Ignace Guillotine, drenching the country in blood. Masonry has been implicated in numerous instances of corrupt practices centered around material gain in various countries. A notable case is the P2, or Propaganda Due, Masonic Lodge scandal in Italy during the 1980s, where it was exposed that the Masons maintained close ties with the Mafia and was involved in illegal activities such as arms smuggling, drug trafficking, and money laundering. They were also revealed to have orchestrated assaults on their rivals and those who betrayed them. Similar revelations occurred in the Clean Hands operation in England, as reported by the English press in 1995. These incidents make it evident that Masonic Lodges are engaged in activities that serve illegal profit motives. This is just a few examples of literally countless others. Please look into it if you're interested. Consequently, the notion of humanist morality propagated by the Masons proves to be nothing more than a facade. The fundamental objective of Masonry's secular humanist moral philosophy is not to foster a moral society, but rather to establish a secular world. We can think of this evolutionary journey as one big Hegelian dialectic of problem, reaction, solution. If it wasn't for the problem of the idea of divine right of tyrannical rulers leading to godless wars and oppression inflicted on the people in the name of God, there would be no reaction or logical need to provide an alternative of freedom through rebranded mystic doctrine masquerading as a subsequent new order of reason through the Age of Enlightenment, which led to the solution of as German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche would say, God is dead, God remains dead, and we have killed him. He believed that the Enlightenment had eliminated the possibility of the existence of God. Richard C. Lewontin, a well-known geneticist at Harvard and an outspoken evolutionist, admits that he is first and foremost a materialist. We, scientists, have a prior commitment, a commitment to materialism. It is not that the methods and institutions of science somehow compel us to accept a material explanation of the phenomenal world, but on the contrary, that we are forced by our a priori adherence to material causes to create an apparatus of investigation and a set of concepts that produce material explanations. No matter how counterintuitive, no matter how mystifying to the uninitiated. Moreover, that materialism is absolute, for we cannot allow a divine foot in the door. When Anton LaVey founded Egotheistic Satanism, or the Church of Satan in 1966, he uplifted the virtues of pride, indulgence, and rebellion. The basic idea is of individual worship of the self, raising themselves up and establishing their own moral codes based on their own preferences. Essentially, humanism is adversarism, otherwise known as Satanism. 
When we look at primary sources regarding Masonry, we see the goal of this organization is to spread a more humanist philosophy throughout the world, and to eradicate the monotheistic religions as the world knew them. To the mysteries, there is no god but the great architect, that is, the god within, or the self. Lucifer, the liberator. Only through secret knowledge can one allegedly attain a higher state of being and progress evolutionarily, a race which considers itself and nature as divine. Choose ye this day, this hour, for no redeemer liveth. Say unto thine own heart, I am mine own redeemer. Which is a line from the Satanic Bible, the Book of Satan. In conclusion, the theory of evolution is not an original discovery of Darwin's. He did nothing more than reapply an ancient philosophy, a religion of the mysteries. Professor Wolfgang Smith from the University of Oregon shares his opinion on the theory of evolution. As a scientific theory, Darwinism would have been jettisoned long ago. The point, however, is that the doctrine of evolution has swept the world, not on the strength of its scientific merits, but precisely in its capacity as a Gnostic myth. It affirms, in effect, that living beings create themselves, which is in essence a metaphysical claim. Thus, in the final analysis, evolutionism is in truth a metaphysical doctrine decked out in scientific garb. In other words, it is a scientific myth. If you don't, if a person doesn't think that there, there is a God to be accountable to, then, then what's, what's the point of, of trying to uh, modify your behavior to keep it within acceptable ranges. Uh, that's how I thought anyway. I always believe the theory of evolution is truth, that we all just came from uh, the slime, and uh, when, we, when we died, you know, that was it. There was nothing. And uh, I've since come to believe that uh, the Lord Jesus Christ is truly God, and I believe that I, as, long, as well as everyone else, will be accountable to him. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. But they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools, and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man, and birds, and animals, and creeping things. Therefore God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen.